Hello, Golden Hour Birth Podcast listeners. I'm Liz, and we have Natalie here. And today we have a captivating birth story from Cami, a pediatric speech language pathologist and mom of two. Cami takes us through her unique journey with both births, one marked by unexpected challenges and another guided by a different approach. We'll explore the twists and turns from a 48 hour induction to a scheduled T section. But here's the burning question for you. How can two births with different paths both lead to a sense of empowerment and restoration? Join us as Cami unfolds her experiences, shedding light on the diverse narratives that birth stories bring. Stay tuned for an episode that captures the essence of resilience, choice, and the unexpected joys that come with the golden hour of birth. One last thing before we start the episode. Cami recorded her own birth story and sent it in to us. We're trying this new approach that allows us to share more stories without scheduling issues or time constraints. If you're interested in doing this as well, just shoot us an email or you can just go ahead and record your story and send it and send it over. We are very excited to make space for more voices and experiences in this community. So let's keep the conversation going and celebrate the diversity of first stories. The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you, cry with you, and hold space for you. Okay, I'm going to try telling to birth stories from my two boys. My boys are 17 months apart. So for my first baby, we we got married in June of 2020, so right in the height of um, COVID, and started trying soon after getting married. And I think it took us about six months for getting pregnant. We, when I found out, found out in like late February, early March, 2021. And then, yeah, pregnancy was, I don't know, pretty typical. First trimester had like evening sickness. So it's like I would get sick in the evening or start feeling woozy in the evening time. And that faded pretty quickly like once I hit weeks I don't know 13 of pregnancy and then in the second trimester nothing too crazy I did have pain in my upper right quadrant and my doctor was concerned about my gallbladder for a little while when I had a second ultrasound after my 20-week scan I went back to the same basically like to the same radiology place and they did an ultrasound of my gallbladder and it was normal it ended up just being like my ribs and the cartilage around my ribs expanding um so yeah that was second trimester and then in third trimester that's when things got a little bit interesting the first thing that happened was I was like 34 weeks pregnant and I just started working in person again after working virtually for a while. And I had to go to a different site to do an assessment. And I was carrying just like a bunch of stuff and also pregnant. And... I was walking to my car. My car was in a parking garage, and I ended up tripping and falling on the, like, ramp in the garage and hit, of course, land right on my stomach. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm freaking out. And I ended up just sitting and taking some breaths and <clears throat> realizing that I could feel the baby moving again. And he seemed okay. So... That kind of helped alleviate some of my anxiety. But I called my doctor and, of course, didn't get through initially. So I was, like, waiting. I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) I'm 
my mind's racing. I don't know what to really do. I'm going to, while I wait for the doctor to call me back, I'm going to go and do this assessment, which I don't know. Yeah. I think if I were able to go back in time and tell myself, like, work's not everything, like it's not going to be your whole life. And you should have just taken care of yourself a little bit better at getting better at it. It's a work in progress. But anyway, so the doctor did end up calling me back and telling me to proceed to the hospital. So I had to go to the hospital. <laughs> After that, and they monitored the baby, I think, for three or four hours. So it was like a long, just like a long afternoon into evening time. Um, yeah, yeah. Do not recommend having that happen because it was not fun. <laughs> And then another thing in third trimester that happened was I started getting these crazy dreams. They were super vivid, super anxiety provoking. Remember one was like, we went to the hospital. We knew the baby was a boy, but like turns out when the baby came and it was a girl and then the baby was taken and we couldn't find her. And I was just like rushing around the hospital and then I woke up. That was one of the dreams I had, another one, the baby died, and I don't know, it's just like a lot of crazy, yeah, just weird dreams that I was having, and I ended up seeing a counselor to kind of help just like work through some of the, yeah, some of my stress and some of my trying to think about things that would help, and um, so that was another thing that, yeah, just kind of ramped up in the third trimester was my anxiety. Um, and then, yeah, the, so then I also had prodromal labor, which started in 38 and a half weeks. It was like 38 and five days, I think it started. And yeah, that was also not very fun. It was very long. My labor was very long. And I feel like it started when, when I started having the prodromal labor because I was just in a lot of pain and did not feel comfortable and I couldn't work because I was uncomfortable. Just felt like it wouldn't, yeah, it'd be very conducive to working. And so I stopped and I ended up getting, I ended up going, I remember going to the OB's office like fairly often for like checks because they were like, well, just, you know, if you think like something's happening or you just want to get, you know, checked out and we can just assess things. And if you want a cervical check, we can do one and see if you're dilating, anything's happening. And I ended up going a couple of different times, but I didn't dilate. I was like a fingertip dilated and slightly effaced. I remember them saying like each time. So, um, yeah, it was just like a long process. And I remember my OB saying as I was, Earlier on in the pregnancy, uh, we would think about induction, but not until you're 41 weeks. So you've gone a week, a full week past your due date. Um, sometimes it's helpful for new moms to have the 41 week induction. Other times you go into labor spontaneously, blah, blah, blah. But when she saw like how uncomfortable I was and how, yeah, just like the discomfort I was in, she was like, the only thing I can really um offer you as an induction earlier like back in because she's like a little bit older of a practitioner so she was like well you know back a number of years ago women who were in prodromal labor like you we would give them basically like a sleep aid and it would help them you know fall asleep and then they would sleep for a good chunk of time and then um you know you would either wake up with no contractions or you'd wake up like being truly in labor so i remember them being like can you just give that to me anyway, please? But <laughs> no, that didn't happen. So, but she, you know, worked with, we worked with the team to get an induction date. So I ended up getting an induction date for when I was like 40 day, 40 weeks and four days. So it was a, still after my due date, which I felt like, okay, maybe I can still go. Maybe I'll still go spontaneously. Before that time, I ended up not. I ended up going up until making it to the induction. So the induction was, I was due in early November. I was due November 5th. So I think the induction was like on November 8th, started on the 8th or the 9th. And it was a Sunday at one in the morning. We went to the hospital 
And it was daylight saving. That night was like the daylight savings night. So we gained an hour. So it was like 1 a.m. twice. I remember that happening too. But so the induction, the plan for the induction was because I was still the, a fingertip dilated. So it was going to be like starting on the, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the drug they gave me. But it was something, a medicine that was supposed to help me dilate more. And I, they gave me like a little sliver of a pill every, I think it was every four hours to try and help, yeah, soften and ripen my cervix. Um, and I remember just like continuing to have contractions the whole time, continuing to feel uncomfortable and the nurse being like, okay, yeah, you're still contracting like every five to seven minutes. I was like, yep, that feels no different <laughs> than what I've been going through already. So we just, yeah, just continued to wait it out basically. So we did the full, I think it was like a 24 hour round of the, the pills and then it was either Cytotec or Cervidil was the drug. But anyway, after that, we did, um, it was like another round of the same drug, but it was a suppository. Oh, and actually before they gave that to me, I remember I got up to use the bathroom and I sat back down. And when I sat back down, I felt like this gush. And it ended up being that my water had broken. So I was like, oh my gosh, my water broke. This is exciting. This means like maybe something's going to happen. Something else would happen. And I remember that being at 8 p.m. So it was like 1 a.m. we got there, 1 p.m. So it had been like a full, almost a full cycle or almost a full 24 hours of the pill. And then we did the suppository to get things moving a little bit more. I remember that night feeling, okay, we've gone to the next level in terms of my pain with the contractions, yeah, just start to, to feel significantly more uncomfortable. And that was kind of like the, I was in, more, I guess, like the next stage of labor, which was still like pretty far away from <laughs> delivery at that point. But yeah, through that night, I remember everybody saying rest, like the nurses were saying, try and rest, try and rest, been trying to rest for like, you know, two weeks now. And I haven't gotten solid sleep because of all the yeah, and everything that had happened. And we did, I did end up asking for medication to help alleviate the pain at that point. So I did get probably like a solid four hour chunk of sleep, which was awesome. At the same time, I remember, oh, when I finally fell asleep, I had this great dream, like a happy dream, which was nice. <laughs> and then I woke up again in more pain. And then it was like mid morning. It was like, yeah, like nine or 10 that morning, they checked me and they were like, oh, you're five centimeters. So I was, things were happening. Stuff was dilating. And yeah, at that point they were like, do you want an epidural? You can have one. And I was like, yep, sounds good. <laughs> so they, yeah, put the epidural in. We waited a little bit more. I had figured he would be born 24 hours after my, after my water had broken, but it did take a little bit longer longer than that. Well, I guess I started, yeah, I guess I did start pushing at the 24 hour mark, like 24 hours after my water had broken. So around 8, 30 or 9 PM the following evening, but he did not come until it was like 1 40 AM the following. Yeah. Yep. So it was like, I don't know. Yeah, it was about six hours where I was in the pushing. I was in pushing for six hours, which was crazy. Another thing I don't recommend. <laughs> it's part of my story. It is what it is. So, um, yeah, we, I, I reached 10 centimeters. And I remember, too, we, just because it was so long, we ended up going through a lot of doctors. So it was like at shift change, right? Because it's that, right, that like seven, eight o'clock time frame. So. At 7.30, right before the next doctor started, the last doctor checked me. She was like, oh, you're complete. You can do a couple of practice pushes with the nurse. The new doctor will come and deliver your baby. So that, that new doctor had come and she checked me. She was like, well, you're more like a nine centimeters right now. Like, you're not, you're not complete yet. <laughs> I remember being like, oh, what? Uh, just like <laughs> feeling really disappointed and, and tired. I was exhausted. Um, but they... I, they got me like a peanut ball. So I, they put me in this position, the nurses, um, and I was, yeah, like after waiting, 
I didn't have to wait long, 30, 45 minutes. And then she checked me again. She was like, oh, okay, you're ready. Let's go. Let's have the baby. So, uh, yeah. So then I started pushing. And yeah, we did the practice pushes. We did the pushing for real. I remember my husband like holding my left side and the nurse holding the right side. And she kind of like, the nurse was kind of like helping me through the pushes and um, helping cue me to make sure like I was doing, yeah, you know, the right, getting the right motion, I guess. And I remember the third or fourth push, not very long, my, my husband's hands, they, he did a little flutter. I was like, oh, he's, something's happening. He feels excited. And come to find out that I, I had gotten some of his head out. And so it was just like, okay, push again, push again. The baby's really close. I remember the nurse saying, he's almost here. You're so close. Cause I was just like, I'm exhausted and feeling, it just felt hopeless. I started, yeah, getting this feeling of, oh my gosh, is this going to happen? Can I really do this? Can I really have this baby? And yeah, it was hard. It was really tough. Then, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was just like a long, just a long time and a lot of power. Um, yeah, so eventually the, they called the doctor. The doctor came in. Um, and I think the pediatrician was there too. So another thing that had happened or they had found with my water breaking was uh, some, oh, I forget the word. Oh, meconium, that's what it was. Meconium had also come out with the fluid. And that I remember being, yeah, like not a little bit apprehensive about not really sure what that would mean for the baby. Um but they said, basically, the pediatrician's just going to be there to assess him and make sure that everything's okay, basically. Because some babies, that happens and everything's normal. And sometimes they have difficulty breathing. So we just have to assess when, when he's born. Yeah. So when I finally did, when we finally got to that point, the, the OB was there and the pediatrician was there. And then I remember... Like the last push, I finally was able to get his head out. And they, I remember the doctor grabbing him and saying something like, oh, that's an ear. Oh, and then they, and then like a bunch of movement happened. So they said, she said something, which later I learned, like at the time did not know what she had said, but later learned like she's called right shoulder indistocia. I learned that later, didn't know that that's what she had said at the time. But essentially what that meant was his shoulder was stuck on my pubic bump. They, I also heard her say, call for help. That's, I do remember hearing that. Call for help. A bunch of movement, like a flurry of movement. The nurse ended up standing on the bed. They pushed, somebody pushed a button. A bunch of people came in to the room. I remember too getting, wasn't really flipped, but it was like, I guess more of an inversion. They moved the bed quickly in such a way that like my head was facing away. And I remember also closing my eyes and being like, do I push? What's going on? I feel like the wind got knocked out of me. Because at this point too, I can feel the epidural wearing off and I can feel some movement, but not everything. That happened. Yeah, flurry of movement basically. And then somebody new, like another nurse came in and I guess at the right moment or just to help motivate me, she was like, come on, mom, one more push, one more push, mom. So I did. I pushed. Then he was born. And they turned the bed upright. And I got to touch him for a second. And then they brought him to the table to be warmed. I remember that. I remember. And then I remember thinking, okay, what ha- what just happened? Is the baby okay? I don't hear crying. What's going to happen? And then it was a couple of, it felt like an eternity, but I think it was in reality only a minute he started crying. And I remember feeling relieved. And then they weighed him. I remember they weighed him. And they were like, oh, he's eight pounds, 13 ounces, mom. I was like, excuse me? (laughs) That is 
not the weight I was expecting. I was expecting some of a, a lighter child. <laughs> but he, yeah, he was here and he was born. And the OB started, like, talking to me a little bit in more detail. She was like, okay, I'm, I'm giving you stitches now because we gave you an episiotomy to get the baby out. So if you feel any of the pulling or anything, just press your epidural button and we will give you more medicine. So we did that and as she was stitching me up, she said, I do want to take a second to explain to you what happened because it was traumatizing for everyone. Your baby was had a shoulder dystocia, so he was stuck and we had to do several maneuvers to get him out. But he made it out. And then the pediatrician, I remember the pediatrician asked, like, how long was he stuck for to the OB? And the OB was said, two and a half minutes. So, um, and then they were all like, wow, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay, I don't, I don't know what shoulder dystocia is. I've never really heard about that. But yeah, I'm just happy that he's okay. So then at that point, I was able to, after I got the stitches and they weighed him and assessed him and they had to do some yeah that I remember that, that at that point too the pediatrician was like okay mom like we're we're monitoring his breathing if he doesn't show like a certain amount of like breath support in this like five minute span he's gonna have to go to the NICU but if if he does if he sh if his levels start going up then he'll be okay to stay so we we waited and he was like, oh, yeah, yep, his levels are increasing. So it looks like things are, things are looking good and he's a strong baby. And, yeah, you can hold him. So then I got to hold him and I got to try feeding him um, in, the, in the room there. And, yeah, after that, yeah, we tried latching. We had a, the nurse help us latch at the beginning right in the room and then he did get to eat which was which was good that was one of the things I wanted to try wanted to have happen soon after delivery so it wasn't wasn't immediately after but it was no pretty soon after time is kind of a blur so I think about it but yeah after that we Moved to the postpartum area. I remember, yeah, just being very grateful at that point, like being very grateful for the nurse and for the OB, for the team, for everybody who like watched the baby and helped to monitor him and stuff. And yeah, so then we started like our postpartum journey. Yeah, at that point, it was probably like three or four in the morning. So I think. 8 a.m. the next morning, the we yeah made it into the postpartum room and the lactation consultant came. It's probably like eight or nine in the morning that that following day. So she helped with the latch, showing us different positions, and yeah, just helped us a lot. Okay, so it's another evening. I'm walking my dog and telling my story. I left off talking about the. My postpartum experience was baby one. So um, the lactation consultant came that following with a couple hours after birth to work on feeding. And then it was also like rotating nurses. So the nurse would come for me and another nurse would come for the baby. And I remember the first time that the nurse came for me, she like wheeled in her little thing to check my blood pressure and check my meds and had the computer. And like when my name on the chart, when she like accessed my chart, this I remember seeing this red flash that came up that said, this patient is on sepsis watch. And I was like, oh shiitake mushrooms what happened to me was really crazy like the whole the whole experience was traumatizing and 
I never wanted to tell people about it for a while. I remember also in the immediate couple weeks after my mom and my mother-in-law both asking me questions and I just didn't want to answer any of them. Like, we kind of like freeze for lack of a better descriptor. Um, yeah, just had no desire to talk about it. I guess because I was still sort of like processing it and processing everything that happened. Um, but anyway, so we stayed in the hospital another, it was like a total of four days or maybe five with the induction and then with the birth because it was 48 hours after by the time we left. Yeah, or maybe it was longer than 48 hours. It's kind of a blur. But anyway, it, I remember it feeling like a very long time. <laughs> but so anyway, we get home. My husband is, I think it would really help you kind of get through this if you sit down and you journal, if you write everything that happened, write down everything that happened, and then maybe it'll feel better like maybe then you'll be able to or want to talk about it a little bit more and tell people kind of like what happens yeah, and i'm happy he gave me that advice it was definitely a good step toward healing not fully healing from the experience yeah i don't know if if they'll ever fully heal from the experience it's just part of the story now now i can tell the story and i can remember the positive parts of it and not be afraid to tell it either so that's yeah I think that was helpful yeah overall postpartum with him really wasn't too bad oh my god how I hear I'm like walking by the road and there's cars <laughs> oh well uh, so anyway, yeah, just in terms of eating, like he was a good eater. He was a fast eater. He was gaining weight appropriately. We were able to get like chunks of time at night at the beginning, which also helped. I think it helped me overall. Um, and from there, When talking to my husband, I remember him saying something like, I kind of want another baby and I want the babies to be close in age. But this was like, I don't know, not very immediately postpartum, maybe two or three weeks. And I was still just trying to process what had happened. And I remember getting like a little bit short with him and saying, no. I'm not even, I don't even think I want another kid. I think I said something like that. And I know going forward that that really hurt him. Um, and I don't know. It is what it is. So we, I came around though. I ended up like coming around to the idea. I ended up working with a therapist on BetterHelp who specialized in birth trauma. And we did, I think it was EMDR is the acronym. But I recommend, if anybody's listening to this and has, feels like they have gone through a traumatic birth process, find a therapist that specializes in this because it's really helpful. At least it was very helpful for, in my opinion. And it's hard to really explain it involves basically tapping into different sides of your brain, thinking about like the rational side, the side that like rationalizes everything, and then the side that's more emotional and more like uh, reactive. I worked with this person. Uh, it was a benefit that I got through work, through like our EAP program, that I didn't have to pay for it because that could be another hurdle that you have to go through when you're finding therapists. And I remember whatever session it was, Finn was 
eight months at the time. So he was still pretty young. And we were having, my husband and I had had a conversation about, oh, if you get pregnant in this time frame, again, like the baby would come in March or in April or May. And like, that would be a good time in terms of your work schedule because you could take a couple of months off and then it would go into summer vacation because I guess I didn't mention this earlier. So I work as a speech pathologist in a school setting. So I have summers off unless I opt to work summer school, which I haven't done in a couple of years now. When we, at the time we were having this conversation, this was like an option that seemed feasible because I would get more time off with him or with a new baby, with, with a new baby and with the old baby. <laughs> and I think I was like, okay, like I can see myself going through this again and doing this again on the one hand. But on the other hand, like in all reality, it took us six months to get pregnant with my baby ones. What are the chances like we try in this two month window and we're pregnant with baby two? Like, we'll just try again the same time frame next year and the kids will have a bigger age gap and that'll be fine. Uh, And so another thing that we had going on kind of around the time I found out I was pregnant with baby two was, so we were married in June of 2020, right in the height of COVID and we didn't really have a wedding that we had initially envisioned, I guess I'll say. So we ended up doing like a, like an anniversary reception in the summer of 2022. So, um, like two years after we had officially gotten married and I found out I was pregnant with baby two, three or four weeks after our yeah, anniversary receptions. There you go. Joke's on me thinking like, oh, this is going to take a long time to get pregnant again with second kid. It did not. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it at first. Again, because I was still breastfeeding baby one. So I just, I'm going to start calling him Finn. That's his name. I was still breastfeeding Finn. Yeah, because he was eight months old and my cycles were not regular. I think we were coming like every, sometimes it would be like every four weeks, sometimes every six, but I was still getting a cycle. So they, yeah, my cycles started again like five or six months postpartum, even though I was like exclusively breastfeeding until, yeah, until he started solids. So um, anyway, all that to say, it was kind of like, I don't really know if this is going to work. We'll see. I was very skeptical the whole the whole process with trying to conceive for baby two. And yeah, so it ended up being like two months went by and I didn't have a cycle and started feeling kind of funny and like nervous. And yeah, I took a test and it was positive. I remember waking up that morning because I had read, oh, if you if you take a test first thing in the morning, your HCG levels are higher, concentration or whatever. That was what I ended up doing. And it was first thing in the morning and nobody else was awake. My son was still sleeping. My husband was still sleeping, but my dog was awake. I ended up just leaving the pregnancy test on my sink in the bathroom and walking outside with the dog. So I was like, okay, wow, doing this again, feeling lots of feelings, lots of heightened emotion and not quite sure what to expect. That day, I called the doctor to make like my first appointment, which ended up not being until I was, I think at that time I was like six weeks along. They were based on when my last cycle was, or seven weeks along. Yeah, my appointment ended up not being until I was 10 weeks long. So like another four weeks beyond the phone call. And then like two days after we made that first appointment, I started spotting. I was like, oh, crap. What's happening? I called the doctor. We have a, an advice line. So I called the advice line and asked, what do I do? And the nurse said, well, you'll just have to keep monitoring and see how much you're bleeding. But if it would make you feel more at, 
at a peace of mind, we can have you come into the lab to do a blood test. So you'd come in one day, we would take your HCG levels, and then you'd come back in 48 hours later, and we would see if your levels are, you know, exponentially going up as they should with a successful pregnancy. Um, so I was like, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so we did that. And I think after the second test, I remember like feeling, starting to feel like ill again, like starting to get that morning sickness come back. And so I was like, oh, well, I guess this means that the pregnancy was successful. <laughs> Cause I remember I had read that too. Yeah. Yeah. I have lots of feeling, lots of feelings about getting pregnant again so fast. And it was like planned, but it was also like, I had kind of said to myself, oh, well, like this probably won't happen. Don't get your hopes up. And then it did happen. So it was, it was a pleasant surprise. And so this pregnancy, this time around, I felt was harder compared to when I was pregnant with my first with Finn. At the beginning, I was a lot sicker. I ended up, yeah, just like feeling really nauseated a lot and getting vomiting more, more often. I think it was, yeah. And I was also going into work in person full-time at this point. For work, I had to take the metro. I'm sorry, metro in from suburbs to the city. It's like a 20-minute ride. Oh, God. And it was just like, well, felt very wizzy. Usually got off and then dry heaved a little bit and then built up. <laughs> Which sounds terrible. But around 13 weeks again, it, it subsided. And I did end up, I did end up around 10 weeks getting prescriptions for the anti-nausea medicine, so Zofran, and a, I think it was called Digled. I don't even remember. I'm going to butcher it. But it was essentially uh, a sleeping pill mixed with a vitamin. I should look up, up specifically what they were. But anyway, it was a combination. Oh, that's what. Vitamin B6 and Unisom. That's what it was. So took that together. And that actually, I would take that at night before falling asleep. And that, I think, helped the most with my, yeah, low symptoms. And then on days when it was like really, really intense, I took some uh, anti-nausea, anti-vomiting. So then around 12 weeks, I did do the NIPT, the newborn blood test, because it was covered through my insurance again. And uh, we found out we were having another boy. So that was exciting. <laughs> um, we, at first I thought, I remember thinking like, oh, this is, must be a girl because I'm more nauseous and I was like craving sweets and I'd read that that was a thing and I don't know you can still <laughs> be pregnant with a boy and have those things happen to you blah, blah, blah. so yeah the second trimester with this pregnancy was rougher as well mainly because I got COVID so I went for my 20-week anatomy scan and then I think two weeks after that, so I was like 22 weeks alone. I remember like walking to work. So I had gotten off the train, walking to work and thinking, I think I have a head cold. Like I don't feel well. Um, but when I got home that day, I took a call the test and it was negative. So then I was like, okay, whatever. Two more, couple more days go by. And... I'm still not feeling great, but I'm like going through the motions essentially. And the, yeah, I ate something weird. I ate Cheetos, which I don't normally eat because I was like craving something salty. And the Cheetos came right back up immediately. I was like, oh, well, okay. Shouldn't, shouldn't have done that. That wasn't good. So I thought it was kind of like a one-off time that I got sick. And while I was getting sick, I started feeling like water 
coming out of coming out of me like I thought my water had broken. Looking back, I had peed myself. However, at the time, I thought, oh my God, my water broke. Because it didn't like smell like urine. Anyway, and I was just, oh no, like panicked and anxious. Called the doctor. She said, keep monitoring. If you're soaking through a pad every couple hours, then it's likely that it's your water breaking and you should come in then. So I got on the train to go home, got in the house and got sick again. And the same thing happened. I was like, oh my God, this is not good. I think also everything was wet. But so anyway, long story short, I ended up telling my husband to take me to the hospital because I thought that the baby was coming. So we all got into the car me and my husband and Finn and it was this was December so it's cold the hospital was like you need to stay outside with the baby you can't bring the baby in because and I remember too telling Mike stop don't bring him inside I'll just go in myself and yeah he got turned away at the door basically Oh, and we've gone to an urgent care first. So first we went to urgent care. We told them what was going on. And they were like, we can't help you. You need to go to the ER. Um, so we did. And but anyway, they did all. Once I went, once I got to the hospital, um, they did all of the testing uh, to determine if my water had broken. It had not. And the OB on call was like, I'm going to get, you also need like a full viral workup because something is clearly wrong with you and you're clearly dehydrated because at that point I had gotten sick more. And yeah, I was just like nervous and wanted to make sure everything was okay. And she was concerned too. And anyway, yeah, we did that. And then I came back positive for COVID and I was like, <laughs> are you serious? Yeah. It was not fun. We, I think I ended up spending a total of eight or nine hours in the hospital from that whole experience. Got home and just could not, yeah, could not function very well. And of course, my son also had it. So we were all kind of like quarantining in the house. My quarantine was up at the on Christmas Eve, so we still had a somewhat regular Christmas. <sighs> but it was not fun. That's what I remember most about second trimester. That whole scenario. Okay, so I am gonna mention in the second pregnancy, when I got my first anatomy scan done, it came back saying that the baby was. 98th percentile and large for gestational age. And so I had two additional ultrasounds after that. So one at 32 weeks and then 36 weeks. And then the other one was at 21 weeks. And each time measured larger than gestational age. Yeah, I think they were all around like 98th percentile. I remember the, when I went for my 32 week one, the tech was like, is your husband tall? And I laughed because my husband is the same height as me. We're both like five, six. So I was like, no. But yeah, it ended up being, so that kind of played a role in decision-making for delivery because with my first, since I had had the shoulder dystocia, when I got pregnant again, my OB was, you know, concerned about that. And so she said, I'm recommending that you have a C-section. Like even this was like in the one of my first appointments and I wasn't ready to accept that as, as this is what we're going to do until the, I think at the point when I had my 36 week ultrasound and the baby was still measuring like in the high 90s percentile and I think was already, yeah, my 36 week scan, he was eight pounds, eight ounces um, in the womb, or that was like the estimate. Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, so 
this ultrasound has a slight margin of error, right? That could be like one pound under or one pound over um, from this measurement. And that just increases. Since I've already had a shoulder dystocia once, I think there were statistics about that too, that I would be at increased risk to have another one. And then if the baby's big, then that would also increase the risk. And yeah, after the 36 week, ultrasound I think it was the 36 week one might have also been the 32 week one anyway after that we decided to schedule a c-section we scheduled the c-section for 39 weeks in one day and I think at that point too my plan was like well we'll see what happens if I make it to the c-section then that's what we'll do and if I end up going early like maybe I would try to have a natural vaginal birth but wasn't really sure at that point and yeah I ended up making it to the c-section so I ended up having a c-section but let me backtrack just a little bit around the time I got my 36 week scan I started having painful I would describe them as painful Braxton Hicks not necessarily the padromal labor that I had with my first but it was yeah just started to get continually uncomfortable wasn't sure what was really going on or what was happening and I just kind of hit a wall with with going into work um my it was like my body's way of telling me like it's time to time to stop with this like time to take a break is the way I sort of interpreted it um yeah so I ended up um starting my leave earlier than I was going to um and yeah so it was I think I had two and a half weeks at home before the scheduled c-section and once i stopped work like once work obligations stopped for me the braxton hicks stopped as well so i do wonder if it was related to stress or related to anxiety around my job and i yeah that was what i ended up doing and i know yeah i had really wanted to go all the way to my due date but that's just not what happened and it's okay <laughs> So then I remember when we got to that week, my in-laws came down for the C-section to watch my, and we drove, the C-section was scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning, but they said to get there two hours beforehand. So we were, so we had to be at the hospital by eight o'clock and it was a 10 minute drive, but the since it was traffic, it was like rush hour, it was a weekday, it took a little bit longer. So anyway, we got to the hospital, I got admitted, did like the pre, yeah, all the, the nurse came and asked us questions. Um, and I, yeah, again, I just remember like feeling really, really nervous about the whole experience. And in the car too, like when we were driving, I was crying because I was like, this is the last time. My Finn's going to be an only child. I had just a lot of feelings about it. But anyway, once we got through all of that and the nurse asked us all the questions, they were like, okay, we're going to wheel you this way. And so I had to wait in this other little spot for a bit. And my husband was, they got him like scrubbed in or not scrubbed in, but gowned up to go into the operating room for the surgery and yeah I remember going in meeting the anesthesia she and the her nurse assistant or nurse they got me set up to do the spinal tap and once that spinal hit it was like whoa everything was numb and I I did have a playlist going for music just before the anesthesiologist did the spinal Somebody started playing the music, which was good. And she was like, I can tell that you have a lot of nervous energy right now. And I just want you to like sit and listen to your music and just try and breathe. Okay. Cause we got this, which I really appreciated. Yeah. Once the spinal was like done, I felt this relief because I was like, okay, we made it. <laughs> From here on out, I was just, okay, I can, I can do this. This, this will happen and this is good. 
just felt relaxed. Then my husband came back in and sat by my head and they put the drape up. And I also just kind of like closed my eyes and focused on the music and the breathing. And then I remember feeling it felt like a really light touch. But then the nurse was like, okay, she like the doctor is poking you with one of the sharp instruments. Do you feel anything? And I was like, no, it just feels like poking. So then after that day, um, yeah, you know, moved forward with the surgery. And then at one point, too, I remember feeling like, um, I also kind of felt like my legs were rocking back and forth. And then I remember the anesthesiologist saying, you're probably, you're feeling some movement right now. And that's from, because the baby is very large, the, the doctor's getting the baby out, basically. And then he was born and he started crying and they lowered the drape down so we could see him. They brought him to weigh him, which was the part I was curious about, like, how much does he weigh? And he ended up weighing nine pounds and 15 ounces. Well, that was great. He was healthy and happy and they got him in a blanket, basically. And at that point, too, I remember in my plan, I'd wanted to try breastfeeding, and I just kind of felt funny. Didn't end up doing it in the room, but then when we transitioned to the post-operative room, we, we, I fed him. And the other thing that happened in the transition from the room to the post-op room was they had to move me, and my the spinal was still going, and the my IV came out, so they had to, like, put it back in. <laughs> I think it was, like, when I was being moved because I had to move beds or something. Yeah, they had, then the anesthesiologist had to fix it. And But I remember just feeling, like, grateful for her because I felt like she did a good job advocating for me and but also telling me, okay, I need to relax. So it was a good experience overall. And then... We got up to our recovery room, or my recovery room, and yeah, just hung out with with little with little baby Kai. Yeah, he was so he was so sweet. He's still such a good baby. He's seven months now, and yeah, he latched well. He's been feeding good. Really, yeah, really no complaints about him. More complaints about me. <laughs> been on a journey with, you probably, as you're listening to this, tell that there was, I was an anxious person before having children and then becoming a mother. Now I feel like I'm even more anxious. And so just working through that um, with therapy and medication has been helpful. Um that's been probably the biggest journey postpartum with with Kai has been. Um, and yeah, I, I joke that I took all of my chill energy and birthed it into this baby <laughs> because he's just, he doesn't get easily upset when he is upset. It's, oh, wow. You're really, really upset about this. But yeah, most of the time he's just like this relaxed, happy kid which is great. I hope he carries that into into toddlerhood. We'll see what happens in toddlerhood, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's me. That's my story. As I record this, like I said, my youngest, Kai, he's seven months, and then Finn just turned two. So I'm officially out of the two under two, but yeah, still, still a lot going on in this house. Yeah. I don't have a lot of tips for navigating having two kids under two, just giving yourself a lot of grace and keeping expectations low, especially those first couple weeks home, like you're still trying to, all right, yeah, trying to figure stuff out and recovering yourself. And then also, yeah, just figuring out how to navigate the world with two kids yeah give yourself lots of grace i think one resource i found helpful was it's an instagram account the her username is chaos with kara 
and she has a guidebook, like a two under two guidebook. And I, I did end up getting that and I thought that was helpful. She had a lot of good tips and strategies for just here's how you can tackle bath time. Here's how you can tackle bedtime, um, and like different ways to just do things, um, which was good. Um, yeah. And then I guess, well, that reminds me too of feeding. So that was another hurdle that like we had to go through just with so Finn the day that Finn stopped nursing was the day yeah I think he nursed like the morning I went to go for the c-section and we tried doing tandem like both of them nursing and it just didn't work for us because he like my oldest just wanted to always be there and he couldn't, it was hard for him to understand that the baby need, while he wanted to eat, like the baby needed to eat. So we didn't, it didn't end up working out for us. But so the couple times once, yeah, just a couple of times we, when I would have to feed him and he would be there, my mother-in-law or my husband distract him in some way. There it was like, screen time or an ice pop because it was hot it was april so yeah it was warm outside so they would take him outside and give him an ice pop and that was like way more exciting <laughs> yeah and eventually it he didn't he wasn't interested in nursing anymore and it worked out but that all yeah that happened so um, yeah i think that's really all I have. If people have birth stories that are similar or different from mine or want to just reach out, I am on Instagram. I am on threads. I think my threads is public. My username is CamiCam5. So K A M I K A M5. And I like writing. So I, yeah, I try to update my threads. <laughs> with a little tidbit about the kids at least every month but sometimes more often because especially with with Kai having been as vigilant about taking the photos of him at certain months with the little blanket like the four month and the six month and anyway I mean, that's what I've been doing I've been like posting a little thing on threads each month about I'm putting a little tidbit on there about how he's been doing and yeah yeah but that's my story. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and found it insightful and beneficial. Remember, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. If you appreciate the content we bring you each week, consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform or sharing the show with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people and continue creating valuable episodes. If you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on our website, www.goldenhourbirthpodcast, or connect with us on social media. We value your feedback and want to make sure that we're delivering the content you want to hear. Before we sign off, we'd like to express our gratitude to our incredible guests who joined us today. We are honored that they trust us enough to be so open and vulnerable. We're grateful for their time and willingness to share their stories with us. If you're interested in taking the conversation further with us, join us on our Facebook group, The Golden Hour Birth Circle. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode, so be sure to tune in. Until then, stay golden and remember to take care of yourself. We'll catch you on the next episode of The Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Bye!